Bueno, buenas, buenas tardes a, a Good todos. afternoon, everyone. We are getting started with our 19th hearing for our uh, ordinary period of sessions. This aims at treating the subject of human rights situation of persons deprived of liberty in the Americas. This hearing has been requested by a group of civil society organizations from different countries in the region because of time constraints. I'm not going to mention all of them, but you will surely mention which organization you belong to when you have uh, your time to speak. Given there is no presence from the state, in this case, you will have 30 minutes to uh, run your presentations. We also have the uh, special guest, the uh, representative for the Office of the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights, Mr. Jan Giraff. He'll have 10 minutes, and then the commissioners from the Secretariat will have time to ask questions and make observations and then you will have 20 minutes to reply to our uh, questions. Uh, Esmeralda Asumena, eh, Arosemena is joining us, then the Commissioner Hernandez and Mr. Rallon will be also joining us shortly. The uh, Deputy Executive Secretary, Secretary Maria Claudia Polito is present and then um, the rest of the team for the secretariat is also joining us and they make it possible for this uh, virtual event to be conducted and uh, of course we have an interpretation team in case you need interpretation so i welcome everyone thank you very much for uh, requesting this hearing the commission considered this is a very important issue that many times is left uh, behind so congratulations for your initiative and for organizing among different countries organizations to put forward this important subject so you have the floor for 30 minutes please introduce yourselves and all those who aren't speaking please uh, mute your microphones and i forgot something the the screen will show a clock. I am not able to see it now, but I don't know if you can see the timer on the screen. That timer will give you the time you have left. I think when you have three minutes left, you will see it in red and it gives you the sign that you need to uh, wrap up your speech. I know it's difficult at times, otherwise I will tell you when you're running out of time. Thank you very much. Hello, good afternoon, dear audience and uh, public. I am Jorge Luis Lopez. I belong to um, Freiba Mexico, the group of uh, litigators against torture in Latin America. It was established in 2019, made up of lawyers representing 17 organizations located in nine countries in the region. And the World Organization Against Torture, OMCT, aimed at collectively fighting torture and impunity in the region through a comprehensive approach to litigation. Distinguished members of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, the nearly two million inmates in Latin America are living a nightmare. The pandemic has exacerbated the already dramatic prison crisis where overcrowding, deplorable sanitary conditions and abuses make prisons even more uninhabitable than before. In a context of severe confinement and isolation in this hearing, You, we can't hear you. I will continue. So in this hearing, we will highlight why it is extremely urgent and necessary that the states of the region take measures to put an end to the isolation and lack of information that has characterized the management of the pandemic in the prison system. This is the only way to mitigate the unprecedented health and humanitarian crisis, both mental and physical, that the pandemic is generating and its consequences on prisoners and their families, and which impacts the whole society and will have dire consequences in the coming decades if we 
do not act. The six topics we will address are one, access to information and, and transparency in relation to the management of the pandemic, strategies to depressurize and decongest detention centers, third, communication with the outside world, four, monitoring of civil society and national rights institutions and or national mechanisms for the prevention of torture, five, use of force and cruel, inhuman and or degrading treatment in detention centers, and six, our recommendations. We will incorporate information and good practices collected by the member organizations in the following countries, Argentina, Colombia, Honduras, Mexico, Peru, and Venezuela. Now I give the floor to our next speaker, David Mejia from Documenta. He will speak on access to information and transparency in relation to the management of the pandemic. Good afternoon. This is David Mejia from Documenta, Mexico. From the litigants group, we have been able to verify that in the 10 countries of the region in which we work, the opacity of the places of detention has increased since the beginning of the pandemic. Prison administrations have had unjustifiable gaps and delays in the transmission of publication of official data on the management and incidence of the pandemic among persons deprived of liberty, notwithstanding the above, the civil society organization that make up this group have promoted requests for information at the statistical level and with respect to specific cases of infected persons, as well as several lawsuits in order to guarantee access to health and the state response to the pandemic. In this regard, we are highly concerned that we have documented a significant number of cases in which family members only received information about the health of detainees once they had died from the coronavirus. This trend has also been reiterated in the lack of information on hygiene protocols, control and prevention of infection by COVID-19. In many cases, the inability to implement adequate measures of safe distance, hygiene and cleanliness have been factors that significantly increase the risk of outbreak of the virus among the inmate population. The following countries serve as examples. In the case of Argentina, in terms of recorded information on persons deprived of liberty affected by the disease, there is a huge disparity between the federal and provincial levels of governments. While the federal penitentiary system records and publishes information on infections, the provincial systems don't have official information. It is also a matter of concern that organizations such as the Local Mechanism for the Prevention of Torture, the province of Buenos Aires, have stated that during the course of the year, compliance with prevention protocols by prison personnel has been relaxed. These uh, non-compliances risk uh, the health of detainees in Buenos Aires prisons, favoring the circulation of the virus. In the case of Colombia, at first, prison authorities released imprecise information about protocols and plans to deal with COVID-19. Subsequently, when the pandemic spread to several prisons, it was found that information on the health status of a particular patient or prisoner was rarely communicated, leaving family members unaware of the health status or condition of the person and, its, and their evolution. While it is true that as the pandemic has progressed, the National Penitentiary and Prison Institute in Colombia has reported periodically on the number of infection, it has not done the same with the number of deaths. In the case of Peru, there is no active transparency regarding official figures on the impact of COVID-19 in prisons. Although the INPE has a statistics model on its webpage, it does not include information related to the pandemic and the statistics uh, that are updated, they have several months of delay. According to the data provided as a result of a request for access to public information made by Comised, during the first wave of COVID-19 infections, the virus affected more than 34,000 inmates. As of July 16, 2021, the figure amounts to 511 people who have died from COVID-19 in prisons. In Venezuela, there is a context of complex humanitarian crisis that encompasses the prison system of that country, which was worsened in the context of the pandemic in the sense since the beginning of the pandemic, the government's action have been emissive in contemplating measures for the situation of those deprived of liberty. 
In Honduras, we don't have an official report from the National Penitentiary Institute, nor on the management of the budget allocated to deal with the pandemic. Likewise, we haven't identified misinformation on the part of the directors of certain penitentiary centers, which are military regarding vaccination. Persons deprived of liberty have refused to be vaccinated due to the misinformation related to experiments and health effects resulting from the application of the vaccine. In Mexico, we have the prison observatory from Documenta organization. As of July 2021, 256 deaths have been reported. In the case of migrants or stateless persons and persons in need of international protection deprived of liberty in place is destined for administrative immigration detention, it is necessary to refer to the omission and even the refusal on the part of immigration authorities to present timely, clear, complete, and comprehensive information regarding the situation of migrants, stateless persons, and persons in need of international protection. The national policy uh, for vaccination in Mexico doesn't establish the measures to be followed for the vaccination of persons deprived of liberty in migratory stations and provisional stations. The information we have so far uh, says that vaccination hasn't started and there is no plan to do so. Finally, it should be noted that vaccination plans in different countries have advanced with significant delays that have led to the need for judicial in intervention. Specifically in the province of Buenos Aires in Argentina, it was necessary a judicial decision ordering it so that the vaccination of the population deprived of liberty could begin. The isolation policies have been important factors at the time of uh, making communication more difficult. In this sense, the civil society organizations are fear that there's um, an under registration of cases and lack of protocols and access to health. I give the floor to my colleague, Dania Kos from Peru. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dania Kos. I belong to Comisef, an NGO from Peru. I will speak on the strategies to depressurize and decongest detention centers. The penitentiary systems in the region have suffered for years from structural deficiencies that have been exacerbated by the health crisis generated by COVID-19, highlighting the terrible conditions of deprivation of liberty and overcrowding that prevent the implementation of effective measures to prevent contagion recommended by the WHO. Aware of this problem, the IACIHR has urged the states on the region to take action to reduce the prison population. And a, a series of legislative and administrative and judicial measures were taken to decongest the prison systems. However, these have been insufficient. In Mexico, the federal amnesty law, which hoped to free more than 6,000 prisoners, has not had the expected impact. Of the more than 1,500 amnesty applications received, only 47 have been declared admissible. There is no transparency or regularity in the operation of the amnesty commission, and unfortunately, only four states have passed the necessary laws for its implementation. In August 2021, a new uh, amnesty law was published uh, proposing a permanent committee in charge of handling pre-release applications. However, as of the date of this hearing, the officials have not been appointed. In Peru, four regulations were approved to reduce overcrowding. Three of these had little impact. The only law that had a considerable impact was legislative decree number 1513, which established a series of obligations for the INPE and the judiciary that must be carried out ex officio, transferring the um, impetu for release to the state. However, this norm has ceased to be applied because the authorities have understood that the lists for collective releases should only be prepared on a one-time basis. As a whole, the re regulations aimed at prison decommissioning achieved the release of a little more than 6,000 people, reducing the rate of prison overpopulation by uh, 30%. However, this keeps being high, reaching to 112 
percent of overcrowding as of July 2021 in Honduras. The issuance of decree number 36, 2020, resulted in the release of more than 2,700 persons deprived of liberty whose health conditions placed them at a higher risk of COVID-19. However, as of September 2021, the overcrowding rate still reaches 261 percent. The lack of success of the measures adopted is due to the abuse of pre-trial detention as criminal legislation prohibits judges from imposing measures other than imprisonment for specific criminal offenses. In this country, 55% of persons deprived of liberty are prosecuted. In Argentina, the Bonaerense and Federal Penitentiary Services concentrate approximately 60% of the uh, population deprived of liberty. The, um, as of August 2021, the overcrowding rate was 199%, and despite the pandemic, no specific measures have been taken to uh, reduce overcrowding or mitigate the impact of COVID. Even in 2020, the population released was lower than in 2019, and most of the requests for people within the groups of risk were rejected. On the other hand, in the federal penitentiary service, although a decrease was seen, the response from the state has consisted mainly on limiting the entry of visitors and isolating in inmates. In Colombia, uh, for more than two decades, the penitentiary and prison system has suffered from a structural crisis declared by the Constitutional Court. Overcrowding conditions, de despite being reduced, continues to be a cause of our concern, along with unhealthy conditions, shortage of sanitary supplies and poor medical care, which have facilitated the spread of the virus. According to the prisons group of the University of the Andes, between June and November 2020, the average number of infections in prisons was 19.16, as opposed to 2.15 among the free population. In Venezuela, after monitoring 111 penitentiary centers, uh, there was an overcrowding percentage of 311%, documenting that only in the first semester of 2021, 72 persons deprived of their liberty died due to diseases such as heart attack, malnutrition, respiratory diseases, and symptoms, symptoms of COVID-19. A similar situation occurs in police jails or preventive detention centers that are being used as parallel prisons. Out of the 273 monitored jails, 221 have overcrowding problems. That is 80.95% of these centers. So we are still far away from reaching the standards to ensure the life, health, and integrity of those under the custody of the states. Thank you for our attention. And now I will give the floor to a colleague of mine, Melissa Scotto. Um, first, I'm going to share a little video. My name is Michelle Becerril. My family member is in Centro Varonil de Seguridad One. The pandemic affected me in that I lost communication with my family member. I saw him practically every fortnight now. I wouldn't see him for several months. It, we had a one 10 minute call a week. And after about three or four months, they implemented 10 minute video calls, but you couldn't really hear or understand anything because it was like intertwined with other calls. And we lost our trust because my relative um, had COVID-19 and we uh, learned about that when he was out of it. So it was this anguish. You didn't really know anything because um, we could hear he wasn't okay in his voice, but we, we wouldn't really know until he saw him 80 months after the beginning of the pandemic. It affected him emotionally because we also had family members who got sick and died outside the prison. So he was very anxious that something might happen to his immediate family. It was, it was very exhausting because that lack of trust that was generated by not seeing us, not being able to talk to us, since he hid from us, he had had COVID, he thought we were hiding it from him, that he had been ill, for example. Good afternoon. 
everyone. My name is Melissa Scotto from the CPTRT in, in Honduras. I'm going to talk about communication with the outside world. The wide and drastic scope of the measures that continue to limit communication with the outside world of persons deprived of liberty in the context of the pandemic has generated a situation of isolation and disconnection, which in many cases has remained for 19 months. And it has had dramatic consequences for the mental health and the family and social well-being with an increase in suicides and violence in prison which is very concerning. This video we have just seen shows the severe damage and that these measures have caused. In Argentina, in the context of the pandemic, visits by family members and external agents to criminal units were suspended and gradually resumed with strict protocols. But in some places, they remained without contact for 10 months in penitentiary units. In addition to restricting visits, educational and recreational activities were also restricted, as well as other rights, such as the right to temporary release. In Colombia, since March 2020, the state adopted measures to restrict all in-person visits, to limit the number of non-essential personnel working in the facilities, and to suspend all educational and work activities. Many of these restrictions still persist. These actions have had an impact in the daily lives of about 81% of the prison population who work or study. The restriction of visits had negative effects on health as family members were prevented from providing hygiene supplies, food, and sanitary protection to the prison population. In addition, the restriction of visits for long periods of time has serious consequences for mental health. As the commission reported, the prohibition of visits in Colombia also applies to psychological and social work personnel, which had an impact on the general well-being of the detainees. In Honduras, restrictions on visits, which were already limited before the pandemic, have increased. The limitations and lack of access to telephone calls um, which had already been reported before the beginning of the pandemic have been maintained. This lack of attention and reinforcement of measures to warranty the communication of per persons deprived of the liberty with the outside world has resulted in a large number of detainees, particularly in maximum security prisons. They are totally isolated and have been so for over a year. So far, there have only been 10 family visitation pilots and they were all subjected to a, the accreditation of a negative COVID-19 te um, test at a high cost for many families who cannot afford it. They are only allowed two hours and they are not allowed to receive food from family members. Another concern is that minor children of the el and the elderly have still not been allowed to enter prison since the beginning of the pandemic. Communication by telephone is onerous for them since they have to buy calling cards that cost between two and five dollars and provide them with three to five minutes per card. And phones are not also always workable. So poverty continues to be condemned since those who have the money to buy the cards are the ones who have access to communication. In terms of health, this has to do with specialists and it's very concerning. Since March 2020, they haven't been going to their follow-up uh, consultations. One of the problems we identified is psychiatric attentions, since that has affected mental health, which was deteriorated because of the lack of family visits and the lack of medical consultations. At one uh, penitentiary center, they have tried to uh, implement psychiatric virtual visits and the patients and patients said that they did not understand the questions of the doctors in Venezuela. One of the measures implemented as a result of the pandemic and the state of emergency was the suspension of visits, which has increased and deepened the food crisis in penitentiary centers due to the fact that family members are the ones who have to pay for the food expenses of the inmates and must regularly bring provisions to the prisons. In Peru, since March 2020, the penitentiary establishments were completely closed in advance to the rest of the population, since it was not until March 15 that measures of absolute isolation were adopted for the general public. Since then, family visits 
have been prohibited. To replace in-person visits, a system of video calls has been created that, that started in November in 2020 and were modules that gave a priority to a reduced number of inmates who are assessed positively. It was a sort of award for good behavior. In April 2020, 65 out of 69 centers had computer rooms, but the limit, the access is still limited. They only have 20 minutes per inmate and there are not enough computers for everyone. The prohibition of visits included the restriction of the right to defense. In June 2020, the uh, relaxation of this measure began. And in October 2020, protocol number 001-2020 in P12 was approved, which establishes a procedure for the exceptional visit of the defense attorney of the person deprived of liberty, which is in person for a maximum of 20 minutes with only one person at a time and with prior authorization from the directorate of the penitentiary establishment. Nevertheless, with the first wave of COVID-19, 42 attorneys passed away as a consequence of um, receiving the virus in these criminal centers. So these visits were suspended. And now, even after the control of, um, after the control of the second wave, visits, these visits have started to come back. I will give the floor now to Lucas Lecour from Argentina. Good afternoon, everyone. I am from the uh, Sumen Association from Argentina. I will talk about monitoring during the pandemic. An announced monitoring in places of deprivation of liberty is, in addition to being a tool for the prevention of torture and ill-treatment, the only possible mechanism for detecting and denouncing practices that violate the dignity of persons deprived of the liberty. In Latin America, even before the beginning of the pandemic, there were difficulties to carry out these controls adequately in detention centers under the excuse that the safety of the persons carrying out the inspection could not be guaranteed. The pandemic was the ideal pretext for the states to avoid external controls in these centers, prohibiting the, the entry of civil society organizations in most countries, and in some of them, even prohibiting the entry of prevent, prevention mechanisms or human rights institutes. In Argentina, the possibility of denouncing cases of abuse and violence in the context of imprisonment was limited due to the restricted access of monitoring bodies. And without monitoring, these persons have less uh, a lower opportunity to access justice. So they could only protest. During the first months of the pandemic, only in extreme protests was the civil society allowed to come in to verify the situation and the uh, conditions of the detention. In January 2021, the uh, national mechanism for uh, torture prevention was able to start investigating in the interior of the country. The use of cellular phones has made it possible to alleviate the situation by means of a more fluid communication. In Colombia, in the uh, uh, monitoring, and in some cases, also municipalities, apart from the isolation of those deprived of the liberty from their defendants and family members, there's a slow activity in terms of monitoring. The practice of not allowing them to enter or hindering that uh, entering has been more and more popular. And the organizations from the civil society uh, are still not allowed to enter, even though singers and actresses and donors are allowed to access those sites. The Solidarity uh, Committee for political prisoners monitors several countries at a national level, but it has only able been able to access two prisons. Legal actions were filed and there was an order to allow these organizations in. Nevertheless, last September, the follow-up commission from the civil society asked to enter over 15 prison centers, but so far there has not been an answer which does not comply with the order from the uh, constitutional court. In Honduras, access to detention centers has been restricted for the National Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, who have denounced that the entry protocol is changed daily and have documented occasions when they have not been able to enter. The same happens with the execution judges who must request prior authorization to be able to access and carry out their work. Civil society was allowed to enter prisons in September 2020. 
but only for the delivery of humanitarian aid. To carry out monitoring in maximum prisons, they must send a written request to the national director of the National Penitentiary Institute in which they must provide the data of the people to be visited. This request takes about a month to be authorized, arguing that it is for security reasons and mentioning a protocol which we don't, do not know. In Mexico, one of the main obstacles faced by civil society organizations, but also by autonomous organizations for the protection and defense of human rights, is a refusal on the part of the migration authorities to present timely, clear, complete, and comprehensive information regarding the situation inside the various spaces used to detain people in the context of human mobility in an irregular situation. In Chile, the monitoring instances have been partially retaken. Cases of human rights violations are denounced by detainees and also by the Penitentiary Ombudsman's Office. But uh, there hasn't been a legal, a judicial response. In Peru, the National Mechanism for the Prevention of Torture suspended its monitoring visits to all places of deprivation of liberty, including prisons. Since the beginning of the lockdown up to now, this mechanisms, mechanism has only started overseeing this in police stations, shelters for children and the elderly, but not in prisons. And there are no plans to resume them until 2022 due to lack of budget. Uh, the case of Venezuela is different because before the executive order for the lockdown, visitations by the civil society organizations had already been restricted, which is why the information we have is um, only from local newspapers, official sources, and the attention to victims or family members. One of the measures implemented was the suspension of visits, which worsens the, uh, the conditions. In conclusion, the restriction the restriction of impediment in, or impediment to monitoring has led to the invisibility of the serious human rights violations that are committed in the places of confinement, preventing preventive controls or the detention of reporting or practices that violate the dignity of persons deprived of liberty. I will give the floor to Oscar Ramirez. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. I'm Oscar uh, Ramirez, lawyer for the community of uh, political prisoners, and I'm part of the litigant group against torture in Latin America. This would be our last and final intervention, and then we would present our conclusions. Please consider uh, the, the time we've taken for your reply. So I'm going to speak about the use of force and cruel, inhuman, and or degrading treatment in detention centers. Although there has been no formal report on an increase in in complaints. We believe there could be a, a supra record in terms of the rules and reduced reduction of monitoring. Um, the litigants group fear that there will be a significant increase in cases of torture and other ill treatment in the context of the pandemic, as well as an increase in the arbitrary and prolonged use of solitary confinement cells. It is also a deep concern that the increased vulnerability of persons deprived of liberty in the context of the pandemic has not been addressed by this establishment or strengthening of confidential and direct channels of communications with NPMs or other independent monitoring as, and oversight bodies is recommended by the Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture. In Colombia, according to the report of the, um, of the commissioner, 33 persons lost their lives in four incidents. One of these cases is from March 21st, 2020, where 24 persons deprived of their liberty died in La Modelo prison in Bogota due to the disproportionate use of force by prison guards. Three other cases occurred in uh, other centers like the CAI of the National Police. The most serious one occurred in Soacha where more than 10 people died, including eight of them who were burned to death in their cells. Such violence incidents were the state's reaction to protest by detainees due to the lack of official response. Um, this is why the Attorney General Office found that during the retaking of the prison, there were beatings and forced nudity, the same in the transfer to medical centers. And thirdly, it is noted that after the protests, some prisoners were held in isolation cells where they would have been beaten, forced to be naked and denied medical attention among other types of aggressions against the dignity, reason for which he ordered the capture of uh, five guards this October 19. It also happened in the prison complex of Cucuta in 
multiple videos, it was recorded the actions of prison officials where they used firearms to dissipate the protest, showing a clear disproportion in the coercive means. The same happened in the San Isidro prison in Popayan, where inmates held a day of protest that turned into a riot to demand improvements in prison conditions. There have also been some collective punishments um, and beatings of persons deprived of liberty, for example, in Villa Vicencia, where some cases of disproportionate and unjustifiable use of force were recorded as the inmates were piled up with little clothing beaten with slap sticks and pepper sprayed. Uh, the state response was also accompanied by a series of transfers for purposes of punishment and re retaliation against several of those deprived of liberty who promoted legal actions, complaint, and protest. Paradoxically, these transfers caused the spread of the virus to other prisons during 20 20. In Argentina, during 2020, there were several protests due to the lack of concrete measures for the persons deprived of liberty in several penitentiary units, such as in the Devoto prison. There was a protest that uh, occurred after a prison officer tested positive for COVID-19. In many of them, there were fatalities. In Honduras, according to the civil society organizations, acts of torture and other ill treatment have been recorded. The um, directors assigned are military personnel. When the executive decree number 068-2019 was adopted under its control, many of the prisons remained closed with almost no possibility of interaction of detained persons with their families. The Inter-American Commission in Human Rights and the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights have expressed their concern, as well as that the state has not publicly reported on the status of compliance with its mission, main results, and plan to hand over the system to civilian authorities. This still persists in 2021. Cases of excessive use of force by the prison authorities have been documented, such as the case of prisoner Angelo Lopez, documented by the Center for the Prevention. Oscar, I'm sorry that I'm interrupting you. I don't know if you could just move on to Venezuela because we already have enough examples in person in Venezuela persons deprived of liberty who have exercised various protest mechanisms to demand dignified treatment in prisons due to the lack of food for example in 2020 in April at least 46 inmates lost their lives and 70 were injured during a violent event inside the the prison and there was um, also an escape of 77 prisoners out of which 53 were executed in recapture procedures. In Mexico, it is worth mentioning the hardening of the measures implemented. This is largely due to the participation of the National Guard, a military institution in the detention of people in the context of mobility and its collaboration to guard and control such spaces. And the situation has a restrictive and intimidating effect both on the persons deprived of liberty and of those of us who accompany the promotion and defense of their rights. So now we are going to give the floor to our upcoming colleague who will present the conclusions and recommendations. Oscar, so we will leave that to the end so we don't take up so much time. We will leave the recommendations for the end. So um, now we can continue in, instead. All right, so thank you so much. Uh, I will now give the floor to the um, representative for the High Commissioner for South America, Jan Giraffe, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, dear president of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights Commissioners, everyone who is present, good afternoon. I would like to thank your kind invitation from the IACHR as a regional representative from the office covering seven countries in South America. I would like to say that the situation of persons deprived of liberty in the Americas represents a multiplicity of aspects that violate the standards of human rights. Even though the different countries have different contexts and characteristics, we can find common factors based on the uh, long-standing deterioration of uh, prison conditions and difficulties of social reinsertion of people once their sentences have uh, been completed. And this has been worsened in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Firstly, we need to mention overcrowding 
issues. All countries in the Americas exceed the amount of persons deprived of liberty that their infrastructure can contain. And this reaches not only the physical space, but also capacity of those officials in charge of the custody and execution of programs oriented to the reinsertion of those persons for a future Pacific life in society. But this is not because of the lack of personnel in quantitative uh, aspects, but all the, also in qualitative aspects. Overcrowding is not able to be solved without the um, correct dynamics. The problem is not the lack of prisons, but the amount of people deprived of liberty and the amount of people that keep entering prisons. Recent stats show that in several countries of the region, the number has tripled in uh, no longer than a decade. This phenomena is explained by the proliferation of uh, hard policies that offer more prisons, increase of penalties and sentences, uh, increasing the age of civil responsibility. This leads to a vicious circle, given that uh, prisons are not able to uh, bring good results in terms of uh, social reinsertion. And of course, in the context of the pandemic, overcrowding has become a very important uh, sanitary risk. On the other hand, there is a notorious use of preventative prison um, solutions. Many uh, inmates are expecting their trials and a good number of them can spend over a year in this situation. It is common to see that this precautionary measure is used as an early punishment, um, which goes against the due process. And it uh, generates the appearance that justice is done. The uh, harm to physical integrity and health in the context of the pandemic, uh, the education and work for others, all this is not included among the rights that can uh, be part of the sentence. However, in different uh, coalitions, all is uh, threatened and in many cases, they are completely uh, deprived of it in the uh, penitentiary context. Besides the sentence execution, the uh, legal and penal systems have uh, that burden without attention to sanitary conditions and also considering the pandemic. All of the above is resulted in um, a broth for organized crime. The absence of the state is proportional to its extension, which has shown levels of unprecedented violence, as it was shown with the recent massacres of Ecuador. Unfortunately, there is a lack of protection for the weakest and the strongest are rewarded and protected by corruption schemes. We need to also add that the responsibility cannot only go on criminal actors. The state is undeniably responsible for the safety of all persons under its custody. There are other uh, dimensions to be considered women, uh, youth, children, LGBTQ, migrants, um, members of the indigenous peoples are uh, frequently in a more vulnerable situation. Their basic needs and rights should be contemplated and the prison could become a um, harder burden to them. Mistreatment and tortures have, have not been overcome. On this uh, point, we need to highlight the work from national mechanisms for the prevention of torture. Undoubtedly, the independent monitoring is a key aspect in the prevention of torture and in making this visible in a definite time and space to see what is going on on these detention centers, not only prison. Our commission has decided to support the work that has been seriously threatened by decisions from the executive power or depending on the context. In this case, the 
COVID-19. We have also served or uh, helped our sources with the uh, reality criterion. The pandemic of, of COVID-19 has worsened the deprivation of liberty situation. It has become evident that some places still don't have access to drinking water or have a restricted access to water. The persons were deprived of being in contact with their relatives, which implied more anxiety and suffering, but it also brought impacts on their mental health, lack of food as well, because there are some countries where the inmates depend on what the families can provide. Unfortunately, prohibition of visits didn't protect those persons deprived of liberty from a contagion that um, came from officers. There was hunger in prisons due to the prohibition of visits and many infections were seen. One only example that is relatively positive was the, that of Uruguay that didn't uh, suspend visits but established a reduction of visits with sanitary controls and even got to have less uh, spread of viruses in uh, or of cases. Initially, we had the conclusions and recommendations under the human rights perspectives. We believe this could result in the reduction of persons deprived of liberty. In some countries, administrative measures were taken that allowed uh, releasing several categories of vulnerable people. However, after certain um, releases in the region, new um, imprisonments came founded in infractions to sanitary rules and infractions to the public order. Commissioners, in conclusion, it is urgent to have um, reasonable systems that can protect the human rights of persons deprived of liberty, because without it, we will no, not have safety. Under the risk of uh, repeating ourselves, we insist that we need to treat the crime as a comprehensive um, phenomenon. And um, this is recommendable. We need to make decisions based on the evidence we have available. And we need to go out of this vicious cycle. The office will continue to work in this line, committing to provide technical assistance under the framework of the human rights. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Gerard the representative of the High Commissioner for Human Rights from the UN for America, South America. Now I will give the floor to my colleagues to ask some questions and make some comments. And afterwards, we're, we're going to give the floor back to the civil society. I really appreciate the detailed report you have presented about the uh, situation in prison centers within the framework of COVID-19. Now I will give the floor to my colleagues. Let's begin with the Rapporteur for Persons Deprived of Liberty, Commissioner Suardo Rallon. Thank you, Madam President. Good afternoon. Dear colleagues, commissioners, Commissioner Esmeralda, Commissioner Joel Hernandez. I would also like to greet the representative of the High Commissioner, Jan Yarab, and also all the civil organizations, the petitioners. I would like to apologize. For personal reasons, I was unable to be present at the beginning of the hearing, but I managed to get in as soon as possible and was able to listen to most of your presentation, which was very detailed. I have several comments about it. I've been taking down notes about what you've presented, a very complete outlook that, that, uh, that enriches the monitoring we do at the commission and which has to do with the situation you have described in a great manner. And also the UN representative has presented a diagnostic that agrees with our monitoring. 
Overcrowding continues to be a very serious problem that leads to many human rights violations because it prevents these prison centers from being controlled. It also hinders the uh, possibility to provide food and health services. It leads to a series of disorders and it has also it also leads to uh, inhuman treatment torture abuse of power there have even been several massacres in several detention centers in our region another thing i found very striking was something you mentioned about how in some detention centers the uh, inmates were unable to contact the outside world for over 10 months. They were unable to receive any recreational work or educational activities, which affects any type of approach for social reinsertion. The suspension of visits has generated that food crisis because many a time considering the serious scarcity in resources from the um, sent from the states uh, minimum food conditions are not meant another factor i find very concerning as a rapporteur for this issue is the situations of torture and the fact that um monitoring organizations were not allowed to access these centers. And within this serious problem, the use of fire weapons has led to regrettable situations. I would also like to share that the commission, all my colleagues, the executive secretary of our team, for all of us, one of our priorities is to visibilize all the situations related to those deprived of their liberty and to point out aspects that need to be improved so that there won't be a systematic violation of their human rights. I would like to say that since this is a priority, the Commission is working with its team on a report about the situation of women deprived of liberty, in particular in the north of Central America. This is an ongoing process. We, as the, we at the Commission are also working on a report about pandemic and human rights. And in that report, the situation of those deprived of their liberty are one of the main focus. So all the information you are providing in regions are monitoring work. And I would like you to know that the commission is definitely focusing on this. To use these reports to visibilize the issue and remind the states of the inter-American standards that might lead to a change in public policies for persons deprived of their liberty. I would also like to say that because of this regrettable crisis in Ecuador, the latest massacres in Ecuador, we have requested the state uh, to perform a working visit the state has accepted. So we will be addressing the prison crisis and it will be my honor to be there with the president of the commission, Antonia Urrejola, who will preside that visit, of course. And during the second week of November, we will be carrying out this working visit to be there on the ground in the face of this traumatic situation in Ecuador. I would also like to use this opportunity to ask a couple of questions. So maybe you can broaden your um, information. So I would like to know how 
the civil society organizations have managed to do this valuable work of monitoring in spite of the hurdles you have explained. I see a lot of commitment. This was a major challenge and you had the skill and the conviction to overcome those obstacles to mon monitor these situations. So it would be wonderful to know how you articulated those efforts. And also on the presentation, you mentioned uh, the documentation of mistreatment. So I would appreciate it if you could elaborate on those practices in particular, if you could let us know if um, prisons are resorting to isolation excessively under the excuse of protecting inmates from the virus, but which um, leads to the deterioration of the inmates. Those are my comments and my questions. I would like to congratulate all the organizations for your work in a context where the pandemic has boosted the management problems in the region. And as the UN representative was saying, we are not talking about creating more prisons. It's about changing the approach so that the policies, the way the state addresses illicit actions, a change in the proportionality of the convictions so that there won't be an abuse of preventive prison so that inmates won't be arriving to prisons disproportionately. And this will call for the effort of everyone who is part of the justice system. And that approach is definitely the way to address these serious issues. So thank you very much. Those are my comments, Madam President. Thank you, Commissioner Ralon. I will now give the floor to Commissioner Coel Hernandez, who is the Rapporteur for Human Rights Defenders and uh, Judicial Independence. Thank you, Madam President. As my colleague said, I would like to recognize the work of the petitioners, Mr. Jan Yarav. This is a crucial issue. Uh, and I'm very glad we can discuss it. It's an issue where, unfortunately, we haven't had good news. It's a complex world uh, in terms of the challenges for human rights. And this might be where we have seen the worst of the crisis in the pandemic. I won't go into detail because you have already explained this. But I would just like to um, focus on three things. I believe we need to keep on addressing. The first thing is the abuse of preemptive prison. You have all mentioned this. You have mentioned how this had had an impact on the overpopulation in prison centers. Unfortunately, we only see setbacks here. Countries have increased the amount of crimes that uh, can uh, be led to, can lead to prison. They use this as criminal populism strategies. So I think that a priority for all the organizations and even for the commission is without a doubt to keep on insisting over and over again on the importance of finding alternative strategies. The second issue has to do with the conditions for uh, prison visits in an environment where it would seem there's less um, sanitary pressure. My concern here is that they kept the restrictions which were somehow justified during the lockdowns. But now in all countries, there has been some progress with vaccines. There has been some sort of return to normality. So we need to 
be vigilant so that these restrictions won't be um, permanent. And finally, monitoring. We have discussed the problems for monitoring. And here it's very important to work with you, with the civil society organizations, but also with the national or, provision, or provincial mechanisms. These, you are the eyes, you are our eyes, you are our ears, because you have the possibility to be there on site constantly assessing the conditions in which inmates are kept. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I was having some connection issues. Now I will give the floor to Commissioner Arosemena. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to acknowledge the work of all the civil society organizations that have presented this important information that is also very necessary so that the commission and its uh, rapporteurship for persons deprived of their freedom can be clear on the outlook in terms of a right that is recognized in I think in all the constitutions of the countries you have assessed, and that determines, because the constitutions determine the objective of the penitentiary systems, which is re-socialization, the respect for life, for integrity, for the integrity of those detained. And after listening to you all, and also to the representative of the High Commissioner, Jan Yarab, thank you so much for being here and for being here always. This responsibility the states have in complying with that constitutional mandate, but the situation you are seeing is heinous. I will say something that maybe won't make much sense, but this is what I felt when, as I was hearing you, as I was listening to you. I felt as if they were concentration camps where the lives of those detained have no value whatsoever. They are only waiting for them to die. This sense of the responsibility of the states in compliance with their own responsibilities, which appear in terms of the penitentiary system, sounds like an understatement, but the community international Así lo ha planteado también el representante de la alta comisionada. Because this, uh, the representative of the high commissioner mentioned this as well. This message of responsibility that states need to assume. Because our constitutions talk about the responsibility of officials in terms of their obligations. So I would like to ask the organizations how you, if you had to assess that compliance of the responsibilities in these countries you have assessed. From one to five, how would you rate each of these countries in terms of that responsibility? And that's national responsibility, but it's also an international responsibility. In terms of um, seeking uh, from the com convention, because, from the commission, because I agree with Mr. Stuardo and Mr. Joel, the commission has this sense of being a bridge 
to work in synergy together in order to assist to bring about the responses you are asking for. That is very necessary. And I think it is important to reaffirm that is the position of the commission. I apologize for, I can't even find the word because it's the destruction of life, the non-recognition of the dignity of these persons. So finally, I would like to give you a reminder of our visit to El Salvador. The thing I was most impacted by back then when I was in the president of the commission was the overcrowding and there hadn't been a pandemic yet. I don't understand how in how they might have been in May 2020, how those human groups I saw when at the play in the place where 12 people were supposed to be together, there were over 100. That's not human. That's something that appears hellish and America does not deserve this. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Esmeralda. I actually think that my colleagues have already said it all, and I want to thank again because persons deprived of liberty are the ones that are left behind the most. It looks like a slogan, but also in times of populism, this uh, this population becomes the forgotten population because uh, we are supposed to fight against crime and we or, or sometimes people forget that something is a criminal responsibility and something else is mistreatment and torture and this occurs a lot in our continent so i want to thank all the comments made and i want to also thank the um, high commissioner representative i give back the floor to you for 15 minutes so you can make your comments and also reply to our colleagues thank you Thank you very much. Now we will give the floor to Carol Cardenas, who uh, will complete the intervention that was left behind, and it's probably the most important one, and that's the recommendations section. Carol, go ahead, please. I think you are muted. Yes, thank you. My name is Carol Cardenas. I'm a lawyer for the COFADEH and I belong to the litigants group. The IACHR resolution 1 2020 standard for addressing the pandemic recommends important measures to address overcrowding in prisons with emphasis on pretrial detention and in the case of populations belonging to at-risk groups as well as measures to adapt detention conditions. However, these important measures have been applied unevenly, even within the same country or region. It is necessary to update the recommendations of the IACHR on deprivation of liberty in order to disseminate and promote good practices of monitoring and access to justice without fear of retaliation in the context of the reinforcement of measures for confinement and isolation that the management of the pandemic has brought about. We consider it's key to promote and convey the following recommendations to the states of the region. Persons deprived of liberty, their families and the general public should be provided with timely and sufficient information on the measures taken to prevent contagion and provide treatment for persons ill with COVID-19 with regular information on the state of health of infected persons. Proceed with the vaccination of persons deprived of liberty on an equal 
condition with uh, implement alternatives to the total suspension of in-person visits by family and friends, including appropriate measures such as the adjustment of number, duration, and frequency of said visits, adapting meeting spaces for external visits, as well as diagnostic tests, hygiene measures, and personal protective equipment, which needs to be provided by those centers. Maintain the uh, measures and judicial decongestion measures implemented by the pandemic in the long term as legal and proportional measures to reduce the high rate of incarceration in the region and the rate of overcrowding that despite being reduced in some countries still turns out to be quite high and a problem of regional consideration create a reliable registered register with unrestricted and updated access on the daily occupancy level of places destined for imprisonment states should produce reports and note the positive effects of decongestion actions taken during the pandemic in order to rationalize the use of prison, attend and give immediate response to the requirements and orders issued through habeas corpus judicial resolutions. Take the necessary measures for the establishment of channels and mechanisms for reporting cases of torture and ill treatment that are confidential and that are directed to independent bodies that do not depend on penitentiary institutions. State should ensure that there is no justification related to the pandemic or otherwise that is invoked to prevent or hinder the pursuit of complaints or allegations of torture in accordance with the use cohen's nature of the obligation to investigate ensure the re-establishment and reinforcement of independent monitoring activities by national torture prevention mechanisms national human rights institutions and civil society organizations following internationally adopted protocols for monitoring in times of pandemic. Ensure material resources for the investigation of allegations contained during the pandemic. Evaluate and adopt programs for uh, nonviolent conflict resolution in the context of confinements, replacing disciplinary sanctions and limiting the sanction of solitary confinement to the exceptional conditions provided for by international human rights law. Take urgent measures for the demilitarization and total withdrawal of military forces from prisons, including leadership management and custodial tasks. Increase the number of telephone calls, eliminating or reducing to the minimum their cost. Allow and facilitate video calls or provide other communication tools to mitigate the effect of visitation restrictions. Promote progressive access to new information and communication technologies in all prisons in the region. Um, Sub subject the use of the quarantine and medical isolation and ensure that uh, conditions are clearly different to the isolation regimes. Maintain access to uh, free spaces and social and educational and recreational activities to the IACHR we request. Include the diagnosis shared in this hearing regarding detention conditions in our countries in its 2021 annual report. Issue a pronouncement related to the traveling restrictions faced by monitoring organizations, including civil society organizations, to enter and monitor conditions inside detention centers, particularly in those countries that have failed to implement torture prevention mechanisms. The isolation that prevails in prisons, which prevents persons deprived of their liberty from, communicated, from communicating with the outside world, the use of force and cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment exercised by security forces, including those of a military nature against persons in detention, as well as the upsurge in violations of the economic, social and cultural rights of persons in detention in the region. Include the recommendations issued at this hearing in its closing statement of the hearings of this session. To update the 
2011 report on the human rights of persons deprived of liberty in the Americas, including the conditions of detention in immigration detention centers. And to the UNDH and the IACHR, we call upon them to convene a public hearing with the mechanisms for the prevention of torture and representatives of the penitentiary institutions of the countries of the region in order to hear the challenges they face in carrying out their work and assist them in the adequate and effective supervision and management of detention centers. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Now I will give the floor and we are going to uh, reply and answer the questions from the commissioners. So we are going to start by Oscar, who is going to expand on the question made by Commissioner Rallon regarding, I'm sorry, regarding monitoring. That said, the obstacles to overcome in terms of monitoring to civil society faced with these isolation uh, instances. Thank you. Yes, about monitoring, what we can say uh, is uh, the following based on the dialogue we've had. The first thing is that we try to implement remote monitoring mechanisms through virtual visits, but we realized that these virtual visits had uh, privacy limitations. Those who are deprived of liberty couldn't really uh, have a good visit because the officers were present, then there were different logistics uh, limitations. Many Latin American prisons don't even have technology equipment for their uh, legal or administrative areas, so they didn't have that for the visits areas, so they were uh, forced to share the time with different hearings or different internal activities from the penitentiary system. So those were some obstacles we encountered as well. The refusal from the institutions to reply for those um, virtual monitoring sessions. We uh, demand uh, um, or we've seen uh, the omission from different officers to respond to the different requests, mostly when it has to do with civil society organizations that are um, in charge of the monitoring. And also, as we know, part of the uh, claims in the prisons were had to do with the access to technology apparatus and this uh, started the discussion about the need to implement new technologies in detention centers so a, a better connection with the outside world could be achieved and they could also uh, come up with uh, complaints or claims uh, that could allow the monitoring by civil society organizations. I think I would leave it here, but I would also like to mention that um, we have the refusal under the sanitary power or the sanitary excuse to let these organizations from the civil society in, but we've also seen other types of actors such as singers, artists, musicians, or, or donors, those that are part of that uh, circle that is friendly to the penitentiary system, those groups are not rejected as we are the, the ones who monitor violations to human rights. Thank you. Now we are going to um, answer the second question about the recordal of torture and how this has been seen in the times of the pandemic. I will give the floor to Magarena Fernandez Hoffman. Hello, good, good afternoon. So in the case of the isolation, we've recorded the use of isolation as a means of punishment. This was done under the excuse of the COVID and it's been even harder to monitor because of the limitations our monitoring had. Something else we've seen is isolation in uh, places that are not uh, fit for that, such as kitchens or other spaces here in Argentina. 
we have a large population deprived of liberty in police stations and the isolation has been carried out in or under inhuman uh, conditions. And also we have seen undetermined isolation times under the excuse of COVID, the person was brought to a place, a confined place for an undetermined uh, period. We have had the case of a mother with her baby in uh, Buenos Aires who presented uh, COVID symptoms and she was confined to a bathroom for about two weeks and we came to, to, to learn about this because she had a phone with her. Thank you. Thank you very much, Macarena. And before we uh, close the commission's uh, part, I would like to uh, reiterate the, uh, the opportunity and our thanks for being heard today. Uh, this is something we consider really important to be analyzed, we celebrate that a report uh, about women deprived of liberty is being prepared. And uh, also the fact that there's a, a report on the pandemic and human rights, and we will be at your disposal for all the uh, resources that we can share in this aspect. We are going to launch a more detailed report uh, next month that will describe all the situations we've mentioned and we also want to highlight uh, the work with the uh, High Commissioner and we thank the presence of the regional representative and we hope we come up, we, we can come up with joint uh, initiatives and talk about a lack of communication with the outside wor world or the problems regarding monitoring and it I also want to highlight where a group of litigators, we have good practices that we've collected in our daily work with persons deprived of liberty and beyond the recommendations we've presented, we could also share those good practices that are quite uh, concrete and that could help provide guidelines for the states. So that is basically what I wanted to say, I want to celebrate this opportunity we were given and I hope and look forward to continuing to work uh, after this hearing, which was so critical for all of us. Thank you very much. Okay, first of all, once again, thank you so much for all the information you have provided. We will be waiting for the written information you'll send it'll be very important for the report we're working on this thematic report on the impact of covid in human rights the press release for this period of sessions will explain or will discuss the hearings but um there are a couple of things you're saying that cannot appear on the press release because we have about 20 hearings so we only um list out the issues treated at the hearings, but we do pay attention to your recommendations for that report and for other pronouncements. And as you know, we are preparing this report on women uh, to pride of their freed of the liberty in the Americas, focused on the North or Central America. And whatever information you can send us will be very important as well. As usual, we are at your disposal. Please do not hesitate to contact us and send us uh, whatever information you have. And also, as Mr. Yarab knows, we are always at your disposal for a joint pronouncements and joint work with the Office of the High Commissioner. We are allies in this joint work, in this joint labor. So. Thank you very, very much, everyone. Have a great afternoon and we will stay in touch. Once again, thank you for bringing the attention of the international community on this issue that tends to be forgotten. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes.